Greetings. My name is Diorgel. I am an associate professor of the creative science course of the Faculty of Science of Shizuoka University. And I'm specialized in aquatic biology. This video is to introduce the lab and especially in the framework of the course of the geoscience department entitled Chikyu Kagaku Kinkyu Newmon. So this video introduced briefly the activity of the lab and introduces also the method that we mainly use in the lab. And the lab is name is the Digital Aqua Lab. Let's start with a little introduction <coughs> for you to know a bit more about me. I'm French. I lived in France until I was 20 years old. And from then I have lived in different countries. I first lived in Belgium to obtain my master's degree. Then I moved to Taiwan to get my PhD while going back to France every summer to obtain a second PhD from a French university. <coughs> Once I obtained my PhDs, I worked in Taiwan for a year, then I moved to Japan for three years to work as a postdoc researcher at the University of Chiga Prefecture. And I finally went back to France for two more years to work again as a researcher. Then in 2016, I started to work at Shizuoka University. For the Japanese students who want to join the lab, it is important to know that, as you can see with this presentation, the language I use the most is English. I might sometimes speak a little bit Japanese, but it's more for casual conversation. My hobbies are martial arts, diving, and traveling. Now that you know a bit more about me, let's move on to my lab and the field of research. I am interested in the response of the environment to anthropogenic effects. In other words, the human impact on the environment and particularly the human impact on the aquatic environment, which I like very much. And this impact actually can take many forms, including global warming, littering, oil slick, eutrophication, environmental pollution, etc. focus of the research conduct in the lab, in Digital Aqua Lab, is the response of tiny organisms that can be found in the water, called plankton. Both the animal part of the plankton, called zooplankton, zooplankton, and also the vegetal part of the plankton, phytoplankton. So how do we study the effect of anthropogenic activity on the plankton in the digital aqua lab? We use numerical analysis by analyzing data that have been collected in the field. We also translate um, the information from the data into visuals, so infographics is quite important in the lab. And most of all, we use modeling, which is an approach that allows to predict the outcome of an effect. 
the modeling approach goes in pair with field data analysis, which helps defining the current and former state of the system. And laboratory studies, which are required to understand the exact effect of the perturbator. Right now, the lab studies, the experiments part, is omitted in our research. We do not conduct any experiments in the digital AquaLab. All the research are performed digitally, meaning that you only need a computer to conduct your research. For now. So this implies that students need to know a little bit of coding. And we use coding um, to plot some graphs, to conduct some statistical analysis, and also to develop models, mathematical models. Coding can be a bit frightening at first, for sure. Um, but at that point of the video, I would like you, the student, to stop the video and watch another video posted on the channel, which presents an introduction to coding introducing the basics of coding in a very playful way. You should have watched the video uh, intro to coding for now. I hope you liked it. Actually, I recorded this video with my fourth year old daughter. I really like that game. So the Swift code that is used in the intro to coding video is fun, it is widely used, but we are not using it for the research in the digital aquarium. Although the coding principle remains, whatever you, the language, the coding language you use, the principles are usually the same. So what do we use um, in the digital aquarium? Mainly as a student joining the digital aquarium, you will be trained in using software like MATLAB for plotting graphs, conducted data analysis, fitting, and so on. And sometimes we're also using the free equivalent of MATLAB, which is called R. It's a software environment for statistical computing and graphics. And the next tool we use a lot in the digital Aqualab is Moby Dick, which is a free software for building and running individual based models with no computer skills. Or you need basic knowledge of coding to develop an individual based model with, with Moby Dick. And mm, you can do this type of model. You have here the results of a model, an individual base model that shows um, how 
some tiny animal with black dots are eating the grass. But what is individual based model? It is also called agent based model. And how it is different from other mathematical models? Well, individual based models are less simplified in one specific and really important way is that they represent a system individual components and their behavior. So instead of describing a system only with equations of variables, right, x1, x2, which usually represent this, the state of the whole system, with an individual base model, you are modeling its individual agent. For example, you are simulating the life of a fish itself. What is important with this type of modeling approach is that you can consider or take into consideration some important aspects of an individual. The first is that every individual is unique. This implies that all individuals, all agents are different from each other in such characteristics as size, location, resource reserve, preferences, as us, as human, right? as any animal. The models can also consider local interaction. Every individual interact locally, which means that you usually do not interact with all the different agents. The fish are not interacting with all of the organisms in the ocean. The organism, they are interacting with the agent, the neighbor in the geographic space. Finally, what an individual model, individual based model can consider is the fact that individuals are autonomous. They have their own behavior. They do different things at different time in their life. And they also act independently of each other. They have their own objective. Now, these aspects at the individual level will actually lead to an emerging process. It basically leads to the dynamic of the entire population. Every action that individuals are taking in relation with the environment and their distance will actually lead to the population dynamic. So here you have um, the example of an individual based model for catfish. Where only the behavior and the response of the environment for each individual was considered or simulated, and you can obtain from this model the evolution of the population for many, many, many months. Even.
So with Moby Dick, for instance, or with this individual base model, you can develop a model of tiny organisms, like the one presented in black here, that are feeding on grass that has different concentration from low, white, to high in red. And what you can study with this model is where those tiny organisms are going and where are they going to stay based on the available amount of food. So here's the simulation where you can see at the beginning the individual were rushing towards the places where the grass was really abundant. And then after they reproduce, that's where the number of points are increased. But you can also see that after a certain point, the number appears to be constant. It doesn't change much. You reach a certain limit. The grass is all obviously keep on growing, but at a certain rate, and you have those grass eater eating it. And so you can also notice about this balance between the growth of the grass and the numbers of individual when it's when there is no more food for the individual that are dying. So you have a balance between the grazer and the grass smell. And it's important to see that those grazers that are feeding on grass are always staying in the same area. You can also simulate the behavior of some entities and the interaction between different entities, such as the classical prey-predator model, with here the predator being the wolves, the red circles, and they're hunting goats in blue triangle. You can study how quickly the wolves are eating the goats and how many wolves you should, let's say, kill to make sure that there will always be some goats. With, this is an example of the simulation with the wolf hunting the goats and you will see that they eat all of them. They manage to hunt them, all of them. But you can, with this model, tackle different questions, such as what would happen if we reduce the sight of the wolf? Or if we make the goat getting tired more rapidly when she escapes? The model will help you answering those questions and test it even more. In the Digital Aqua Lab, we don't simulate wolves and goats, but we focus mainly on planktonic organisms. And we mainly focus on copepod. It's a tiny crustacean that plays a silent role in the aquatic food web. And it has been shown to be the perfect organism for assessing the impact of diverse environmental hazards. With Moby Dick, I have developed an individual base model that can simulate the population dynamics of an egg-bearing copepod. In other words, the model considers the variations of size and age composition of the populations throughout time.
At an individual scale, the model simulates the life cycle of an egg-bearing copepod. Egg-bearing is, in order to um, categorize the type of copepods who are carrying their eggs until they hatch. This process involves a special time component in the reproductive process, the reproductive cycle, which is considered in the model. Then each individual that hatches go through an entire life cycle, which is composed of um, three life stages, the larvae, the juvenile, and the adult. There are six larval stages that we call nopli. Once the sixth nuclear stage is reached, the individual goes through a metamorphosis process, similar to a caterpillar metamorphosing into a butterfly. And then the, the copepod becomes a juvenile. Then the juvenile stage is called copepoda. And there is five copepodid stages. On the fifth one, you can differentiate male and female for the species we modeled. It depends, it varies on species. And after maturation, the individual becomes either an adult male or female. Then the female can produce some eggs, which will also go through the same life cycle and create new individuals. So the model simulates this development for many individuals at the same time. Now, can, what can we do with this type of model? For example, I use this model To identify the main drivers of the population dynamic of a copepod in the Seine estuary in France. Its name is Uritomora affinis, E affinis. So what we did is implementing the effect of temperature and predation in the model and tested how variation of one of these parameters will affect the population dynamic. and especially the seasonal cycle of Uritomorphis. Here you have an example of the typical results the model can provide you, which is the numbers of individuals for every stages of group of stages. In gray, these are the results of the simulation. And each simulations are a little bit different from each other simply because the model is considering individual variability. So all individuals that are simulated are not the same at each run. But usually what we do is we run the simulation several times and we take the average of those simulations, which are represented here with the blue line. You also have presented on the second column and third row. In blue and green are the variation of this survival of nuclear stages in green and adult stages in blue and cyan. And you also have the temperature in yellow. So what can we observe with this type of results? Well, first, when you look at these results, you need to pay attention to what we call the stage succession, making sure that your model is actually taking into consideration the development, which is to go from one stage to another, which is the case. So you have peaks usually that are going one after another. Also, what we can check is 
making sure that the model is taking into consideration the generation time, which is the entire time from an individual to go from hatching to um, being an adult and create itself new eggs or new no poop. So when we look at the distance between two pigs here in C3, it's about 45 days. And the temperature that matches this duration between those two pigs is about 5 degrees. And this is what has been observed in the field by a previous study, which means your model considers the proper development time of your ecomorphism and the effect of temperature on the development time. Now, when you sum up all these individuals in every stages, you have the entire population dynamic, the total album. Again, in gray are the different runs, and in blue, the average. Now we have two squares in blue here. The first one on the left shows that we have during spring an increase in the population. And the second one on the right hand side shows a drop in summer. This was also observed in the field in 1998 why the model was created in 2013 based on data from the lab. So with data from the lab, you implement it in the model and the model can simulate something similar to what has been observed in the field. This referred to the triangle presented earlier in the presentation. Now we can go a little bit beyond once we have checked that your model is working properly and giving you some results that are similar to what has been observed in the field. You can now use the model in order to test the effects of interesting factors. Here I will show you the effect of, let's say, global warming and increasing temperature. On the top here you have uh, the equation that of the that simulate the seasonal variation of temperature along the year. You have on the left hand side the variation of the temperature in the scene estuary that has been recorded with a 10 minutes intensity, 10, 10 minutes frequency. And so when you consider the mean value Tm, is the mean values of temperature along the year. In the equation, the parameter is Tm, right, which matches pretty well with the results from temperature observed in the field. And you have in the center the numbers of individuals, the total number of individuals. And if we increase this temperature, the mean temperature by 0 0.25, what's going to happen? Well, what we see is we have an increase in the number, and we also have the peak that are appearing a little bit earlier than when the temperature is only 13 degrees. How about if we keep on increasing? very small increase, subtle increase, subtle change, right? 0 0.25 degrees again. So from the initial temperature, which was 13 degrees, when we moved to 13.5, the population almost doubled. And the peak is appearing about 10 days earlier especially the second one. The 
kept on increasing and increasing. There's an increase of 0 0.75. Again, still increasing and increasing in terms of number of individuals. But we have more for a longer period also. And with one degree, the increase is very important. And the appearance of the paper, which is about 20 days earlier, is also quite important <coughs> for the dynamic of the entire system. Couple birds play a salient role in the food web, right? They are the food for fish larvae and also some shrimps. If the responses to this increase in temperature for fish and shrimps does not match the one for the response for copper birds, which is an earlier appearance, then the copper birds will appear earlier and they may decrease when earlier, and they will decrease when the fish are actually getting more and more numerous and when they need more and more food. This is phenomenon is called a mismatch, and this can have some dramatic consequences. So it is really important to understand what would be the response of of course, carpet bugs, but also the other members of the food web. So this was just an example of what we can do. Here we have another example of um, how to use this type of model for conducting um, some experiment or simulating experiment on additional levels. The model that I presented was using or taking into consideration this particular reproductive cycle of the egg carrying copper buds, egg bearing copper buds. Then we can adjust this model from a species to another one. And that's what that's what we did with switching to another species, a cycloploid copper bud. And we implemented in the model some results that were obtained in the lab on the effect, exact effect, of UVB radiation on this copper bud. So we got the data on the the effect in the lab. We implemented in the model, we changed a little bit the model to fit to the new species. And then we use the model in order to test the effect, or what would be the effect, the combined effect of UV radiation of different aspects on the survival and on the etching. That leads to a paper published in 2021, where you have in the middle of the, the slide the effect that were considered, the, survival, the effect on survival rate, the effect on the etching success, and um, the variation of the blood size. And basically what we tested is the different levels of UVB radiation and what would be the consequence on the total egg production and total numbers of nuclei. So basically you switch it from an individual level to a cohort level in that case, because we simulated mainly females. So in, with this type of model, you have an idea of the consequence of the different levels of UV radiation 
on bigger production in Python. And what this model showed is that it was really important for copy codes to have an escape behavior quickly when they are exposed to UV blue radiation. Otherwise, their population, their production is dramatically affected. As you can see between the red line in the top right hand corner, which is a total cumulated egg production, can strongly be affected. It decreases really quickly. It's just a little increase in UV radiation. Thanks to several collaborators, we have access to some data to calibrate the model for different copper pod species that are spread all over the world. The calibration of the model for several copper pod has been either initiated or it's ongoing. And um, so we have some data to create a model for the following species. For um, Cetodiopsin samindaili in, in Taiwan. Heogiapsin Jap japonicus, which is a species, uh, the main copper bud and dominant zooplankton in Lake Biwa in Japan, which has been initiated. We initiated also the development of the model um, on Archaeogapsinus salinus, which is a species from Spain. One of the fourth year students is working on the development of um, the model for Archaeogapsinus dorsalis in the Philippines, which is um, an invasive species from different lakes in the Philippines. We're also uh, working on the development of the model for Apocyclops roi, which is a species, a uh, cyclopod species uh, from Taiwan, and it's extremely used for aquaculture purpose for feeding fish larvae. So once the model are developed, Those models are used to tackle the questions in two main fields that we investigate in the Digital Aqua Lab. First being uh, the effect of global warming. Especially we have an interest in um, the adaptative strategies or exotherms to global warming using copper pods as um, the model. And we also uh, conducting experimental simulations on in the field of ecotoxicology, where we extrapolate um, the effect of pollutant that are measured in the lab, um, similar to the study presently presented earlier with the effect of UVB radiation. For the third axis um, that we investigated in the Digital Aqua Lab, I suggest you have a look at the website. There are several papers that are published in this field. On top of those two previous fields of research, which we investigated with the uh, models, we're also interesting in um, using the models for aquaculture purpose. So the model's aims is to help establishing copper culture and maintaining 
the culture in good conditions and also um, managing the culture including the defining the proper condition the best condition to uh, optimize the culture having the the best output from the mod from the culture the best production and including the what is the time the proper time for harvesting the number you can harvest without um, jeopardizing the the culture and so on you may wonder whether the digital equality is only focusing on copy bugs that's true we focus mainly on copy bugs but not only One of my fourth, previous fourth year students expressed her interest in fish. And so she, she started to work on the development of an IBM for stickle back fish, combining a dynamic energy budget model with a life cycle individual case model. It was a very challenging task, and, but she learned a lot by doing that. She couldn't lead the project to conclusion, but she still learned a lot from there. And it was interesting for me to study also about the models developed for fishes. And the Digital Aqualab also hosted a postdoc from Taiwan. He developed a model on fish also, it was more of a theoretical model uh, initially for Atlantic cod, that is smaller. But because of the lack of data on the species and our interest and questions were low, and we were more focused on doing a theoretical model rather than models simulating the real species <clears throat> so the model in brief um, define some rules on the displacement of the fish which is able to evaluate the surrounding habitat quality and move to one that maximizes its fitness so for example, uh, the red fish that are age class one has an habitat preference of 0 0.1, which matches with the white cell on the top row. So when you run the simulation, you can see this going on. The red fishes move towards the white cells and stay in the cells with an habitat index of 0 0.1, so the optimal. Or they are also sometimes staying a little bit close to it, 0 0.2. Those are the basic rules of behavior, choosing a habitat based on your preferences. So what do we do with this model? Well, previous studies, empirical studies, so getting from the data uh, collected in the field, show that um, the size selective fishing, which is selecting most of the time bigger individuals, may influence the spatial distribution, which is important for the resilience of the population. And with the model we showed that the habitat preference, the carrying capacity and the landscape structure 
affect the response of population spatial variability to size selected fishing. There will be a video on this paper that has been recently published in the near future on this YouTube channel. So the digital Aqualab in the nutshell is using a lot copy plus to investigate uh, the response of aquatic ecosystem to anthropogenic pressure via the development of individual and base model. But we are also open to investigate any scientific questions on other organisms such as fish, shrimps, whatever. Mainly ectotherms and aquatic ectotherms. Mm. The research theme of the labs covers adaptation, resilience, and, and ecotoxicology, which are all innovative areas. So for more information um, on the resilience, I, even adaptation and ecotoxicology, I recommend you to have a look at the lab website, where you can also have the list of the papers that have been published by the labs so far. And finally, uh, the lab environment and research framework are international. I have many collaborators abroad. And we also have some students from the um, France and Taiwan coming in the lab. This gives the lab um, an international dimension and that provides a good opportunity for any Japanese students who are willing to improve his or her English skills. So for more information, um, again, please have a look at the lab website and feel free to contact me by email to set up an appointment and meet in my office. Yo les 